Curl Poppers, The Open Society and Its Enemies, published in 1945, is an interesting book, if for all of the wrong reasons. It fields a critique against a tendency he calls historicism that is completely valid, and would be completely valid in this book if it applied to anyone it actually addressed, which it doesn't. It enshrines and valorizes political ideals, but at the expense of obfuscating the conditions of not only their realization, but also their very conceptualization. Nonetheless, it still manages to espouse a coherent political philosophy, not one nearly as compelling as Popper thinks, but one worth taking seriously all the same. This series will criticize the Open Society and its enemies thoroughly, and since the goal is thoroughness, it will run long, both in the number of episodes and in the amount of time it will take to complete. This is because, in order to do it and its victims full justice, I will have to personally review and make myself sufficiently, which is to say significantly more, conversant with the work of every figure Popper targets. And that means Plato, Aristotle, Hegel, and Marx, along with others Popper cites, as well as others he does not. And we're doing the lot. It is a very tall stack of pages. Because we're going to go section by section through this terrible, often tedious, hack-and-slash attempt at political philosophy, strip it down to its bones, and isolate every thin fiber of collagen worth salvaging. Because, despite my intense disdain for this awful, awful book, there are some. So without further ado, let's get into it. If political theory is obsessed with space, as in the spatial divisions comprising the ontology of institutions, classes, war, government, etc., then political philosophy is profoundly concerned with time. Philosophy is concerned with truth. Whatever process and or procedure we use to attain to truth, being such, it will take place over time. Since the effort requires community in order to sustain that procedure beyond the span of one human life, philosophy is now concerned with community. The trajectory of a community's life in time is determined by where it starts and where it ends. The best community is one which arrives at justice and truth insofar as these are the same. Thus political philosophy, being intensely concerned with the end, is intensely concerned with the means that gives rise to it, with time. The beginning is what gave rise to the end. The end is what the beginning gave rise to. If we argue like Hobbes that mankind began in a war of all against all, then an explanation of how civil society came to be, and with it our capacity to carry forward projects of long duration, like philosophy, is a story of mankind changing from a state of war to a state of civil society, with all the implied terms necessary to turn the one into the other. Alternatively, if we say that God made mankind in his own image, and that in the beginning our condition was idyllic, then the story is not one of escape from a state of war, but of a fall to a lesser condition, implying another set of necessary moves to account for our present form of life. A line is defined by two points, and whatever qualities that line bears is entirely determined by where those points are drawn. All this to say that the most surefire way to do an historical analysis of political philosophy badly is to approach it with an aim to rooting out the hidden genealogy of some presently held cultural bugbear, taken naively as an essential feature of the human condition. The bugbear in question in the open society is totalitarianism, which Popper essentializes as a perennial enemy of human freedom, quote, as old or just as young as our civilization itself, unquote. Indeed. The book's argument is principally, or at least such as Popper's ambition, directed against historicism, which Popper understands as the attitude that the task of the social sciences is to discover hidden laws which govern human affairs and by which the future of such can be accurately predicted. This matters because historicism in Popper's view, and there's some merit on some level to this, although we need to peel away a mountain of conceptual conflations to find it, is that which motivates and justifies the totalitarian's dictatorial attitude to governance. Because if the future can be predicted with the reliability of established laws, then the future can be forced. Quote, 
It is widely believed that a truly scientific or philosophical attitude towards politics and a deeper understanding of social life in general must be based upon a contemplation and interpretation of human history. While the ordinary man takes the setting of his life and the importance of his personal experiences and petty struggles for granted, it is said that the social scientist or philosopher has to survey things from a higher plane. He sees the individual as a pawn, as a somewhat insignificant instrument in the general development of mankind, and he finds that the really important actors on the stage of history are either the great nations and their great leaders, or perhaps the great classes or the great ideas. However this may be, he will try to understand the meaning of the play which is performed on the historical stage. He will try to understand the laws of historical development. If he succeeds in this, he will of course be able to predict future developments. He might then put politics upon a solid basis and give us practical advice by telling us which political actions are likely to succeed or likely to fail." Unquote. As an aside, it's worth noting that this is not how the term historicism is generally used. Historicism generally refers to a methodological approach which understands knowledge to be conditioned by history. It has philosophical precedents going back to Rousseau who challenged the description of the free state of nature depicted in Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan on the grounds that it ascribed to primitive man cognitive traits that only arise in consequence of the emergence of civilization. Historicism as an explicit doctrine finds its origins in the works of Vico and Herder, who, in distinct opposition to Popper's characterization of it, insisted that the uniqueness of every historical epoch and human experience generally did not yield that history could be predicted according to universal laws. Isaiah Berlin, who with caveats in his 1954 essay, Historical Inevitability, endorses Popper's critique of what Berlin specifies as quote-unquote metaphysical historicism, puts it best in an essay published 11 years later called Herder and the Enlightenment, where he writes that quote, Herder maintained that every activity, situation, historical period, or civilization possessed a unique character of its own, so that the attempt to reduce such phenomena to combinations of uniform elements and to describe or analyze them in terms of universal rules tended to obliterate precisely those crucial differences which constituted the specific quality of the object under study, whether in nature or in history. To the notions of universal laws, absolute principles, final truths, eternal models and standards in ethics or aesthetics, physics or mathematics, he opposed a radical distinction between the method appropriate to the study of physical nature and that called for by the changing and developing spirit of man." Unquote. We will return to this in a later episode when we reach the section on Hegel. For now it will suffice to emphasize that the quote-unquote historicism of which Popper will quite incredibly accuse everyone from Hesiod to Marx means precisely the opposite of how it is used by virtually everyone else. The point is that every case of so-called historicism which Popper points to in his text is going to be something he discovers based on his own interpretation, leaving Popper at liberty to construe any sentence as bearing historicist implications whenever he needs them to. This presents a serious problem because Popper's strategy is going to be to show how the influence of an historicist tendency in ancient Greek philosophy and thought going back to Hesiod but honed into its most dangerous and infectious form via Plato in particular, is the principal influence upon the historicism of Hegel, the Sauron to Plato's Morgoth, compared to whom Marx is only Saruman. From Hegel's historicism of the state do we get the split totalitarian ideologies of racialism or fascism and Marxism. A short final digression on this point before we actually begin digging into the text, because it's actually important in this case. The Open Society and its enemies is not only profoundly ideologically loaded and conceptually sloppy, it is simply way too long. The subjects of its critique range from poets writing prior to the Athenian democracy to the writings of Karl Marx. As a work of popular political philosophy aimed at a general readership, and it is aimed at a general readership, it is simply too big. It's too big even for Popper, who is operating well outside the range of his own expertise, which is why he relies on stretching essentialized and universalized concepts across millennia, well beyond where they can have any descriptive value with respect to the actual state of things to which any of the subjects of his critique are responding. More to the point, it's beyond most people's competence. Popper failed to do his due diligence while simultaneously putting out a book polemicizing against such a wide range of figures and ideas that the average reader simply doesn't have the background knowledge to vet any of his claims, and more to the point, the book is so meandering and repetitious that they wouldn't even likely have time to if they did have the background knowledge. Now, being long isn't necessarily a point of criticism against a book. If we were discussing something much longer, say, like Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, which is long 
because that's simply how long it takes for him to establish his logic thoroughly, or something more directly comparable in both size and subject matter, like Hannah Arendt's The Origins of Totalitarianism. In these cases, lengths wouldn't be an issue because the lengths of these texts correspond to the development of an argument requiring many steps and many examples. The length corresponds to the content. The bulk of the open society and its enemies, however, is just concerned with showing that the philosophers it deems worthy of mention bore historicist attitudes and on those grounds alone influenced those successors of theirs, again, those it cares to note, to perpetuate historicist attitudes in their own thought. In many cases, it amounts to a mere catalog. The second chapter of this book, following an introduction to Popper's idea of historicism, as well as the first section addressed to a specific philosopher by name Heraclitus, is a microcosm of the book as a whole, a case made on scant evidence against a thinker who was barely understood by Popper and who lived and wrote in a context that renders the accusation itself absurd. Before diving into it, let's return to Popper's account of historicism in the quote I gave at the beginning of this video and take stock of some of the requisite conditions of an historicist approach, as Popper construes it, being conceptually possible. We shall return to this notion of historicism to criticize in a future episode of this series because it is laden with modern assumptions about the constituent parts of the human world, but taking Popper at his word for the time being. Quote, it is widely believed that a truly scientific or philosophical attitude towards politics and a deeper understanding of social life in general must be based upon a contemplation and interpretation of human history." Unquote. This requires that a widely held belief that a truly scientific or a philosophical attitude towards politics can exist. For this distinction to obtain, this widely held belief cannot be widely held among merely non-scientific laymen or non-philosophers, but must be held by a community of scientists and philosophers. This additionally requires that the idea of a deeper understanding of social life, itself implying at minimum a persistent notion of the category of the social, forms a part of either everyday or academic speech, is possible. Finally, it requires a notion of history that stands apart from human inquiry as such. This last point is especially important since the Greek root of our word history doesn't originally mean a chronicle, but an inquiry. Moving on. Quote, While the ordinary man takes the setting of his life and the importance of his personal experiences and petty struggles for granted, it is said that the social scientist or philosopher has to survey things from a higher plane. He sees the individual as a pawn, as a somewhat insignificant instrument in the general development of mankind and he finds that the really important actors on the stage of history are either the great nations and their great leaders, or perhaps the great classes or the great ideas." Unquote. We require here, at a minimum, a notion of the general development of mankind as an overarching trajectory above any particular community or culture, implying the idea that history is a separate domain from other theaters of human life, a domain with its own distinct rules and stakes. We require also a notion of specific species of elements that are peculiarly relevant to that theater, referred to here as quote-unquote great such-and-suches. And finally, the notion that ideas have a life and impetus all their own that can play the part, do the same damage, if you will, as a concrete community, a quote-unquote great nation on the stage of history. And finally, quote, however this may be, he will try to understand the meaning of the play which is performed on the historical stage, he will try to understand the laws of historical development. If he succeeds in this, he will, of course, be able to predict future developments. He might then put politics upon a solid basis, and give us practical advice by telling us which political actions are likely to succeed or likely to fail." Unquote. We require here a notion of law that applies in the domain of history, that the world proceeds according to fixed rules akin in rigidity and legibility as legal rulings or institutions. Adherence to such in our reasoning places politics, whatever this is taken to mean, upon a solid basis. Note that none of these exist in any form prior to the 5th century BC, before which history simply means again inquiry, not a plane of existence, where quote-unquote philosophy has not yet been set apart by Plato as the pursuit of ultimate truth, and where the notion of deliberate constitution-making, indeed even the notion of decay, what we typically render as justice, of a proper order in the world to which human affairs can be made to align that is requisite to the idea of better or worse constitution-making, are only recent cultural inventions. Historicism is simply not plausible as an element of any ancient Greek thought. 
So we turn now, with this in mind, to Popper's account of the earliest roots of historicism prior to Plato in his first chapter on a named philosopher, Heraclitus. Popper lays the roots of historicism not at Heraclitus' feet alone, however, but begins with an account of the treatment of history in the earliest ancient Greek poetry, writing that, quote, In Homer's theistic, or rather polytheistic, interpretation, history is the product of divine will, but the Homeric gods do not lay down general laws for its development. What Homer tries to stress and to explain is not the unity of history, but rather its lack of unity. The author of the play on the stage of history is not one god, a whole variety of gods dabble in it. What the Homeric interpretation shares with the Jewish is a certain vague feeling of destiny and the idea of powers behind the scenes. But the ultimate destiny, according to Homer, is not disclosed, unlike its Jewish counterpart. It remains mysterious." Unquote. Homer is the good non-historicist poet whom Popper will momentarily contrast with the historicist Hesiod. Popper is trying to be critical by arguing that Homer is not trying to explain the unity of history. He fails categorically by insisting upon an opposite notion, that Homer is trying to explain history's lack of unity, which rests upon an equally absurd presumption. History is simply not a concept in Homer's toolkit. It will not be in anyone's toolkit until centuries later when the likes of Herodotus and Thucydides inquire into the causes and progressions of the Persian and Peloponnesian Wars, respectively, effectively creating the genre. Homer is most certainly not trying to make any statement about history because Homer has no notion of history to begin with. The same is true, incidentally, of the Jewish text to which Papa refers, and which you will have noticed I haven't addressed. We will return to that in a future episode because that's a whole other can of worms. Moving on, as I said, Popper contrasts Homer with Hesiod, quote, The first Greek to introduce a more markedly historicist doctrine was Hesiod, who was probably influenced by Oriental sources. He made use of the idea of a general trend or tendency in historical development. His interpretation of history is pessimistic. He believes that mankind and their development down from the Golden Age are destined to degenerate, both physically and morally." Unquote. The reference here is to Hesiod's poem, Works and Days. At less than 30 pages, it's short enough to be read within the span of a couple hours, and is just... special. To the point, however, Hesiod does indeed give a genealogy of what we might call modern human beings stemming from a common origin point with the gods. The first generation lived contemporaneously with the reign of Zeus's father Cronus. They were gold and immortal. They now exist, in Hesiod's account, as divine spirits having been quote-unquote covered up by the earth, whatever that means. The second race is silver, not immortal, but with a long adolescence and then a shorter adulthood. Also covered up by the earth. The third race is made of ash trees and wore bronze armor and are, according to Hesiod, responsible for their own destruction. They were mighty, but they are dead, and unlike the previous cases, are not described as having been covered up by the earth, but are sent down to Hades. The fourth generation are heroes, Heracles, Achilles, etc. The fifth generation are us. We are weaker and have to toil much more than previous generations of humans, and Hesiod wishes he was not one of them. So yes, in a sense, Popper is right. Humanity has, on Hesiod's account, quote-unquote, degenerated. However, Hesiod doesn't argue that humanity as such will degenerate further since he prefaces his description of the fifth type not just by lamenting that he wasn't dead before the current generation of humans came to be, but also that he wasn't alternatively born after. There is no inevitability attached to history. The different races of human beings are not even directly related to each other, but are in each case unique creations by the gods, and not even the same gods in each case. And our common lineage with the gods isn't like that which we conjecture about ourselves and other primates where we both share a common ancestor, but that the first generation was made by Cronus just as he fathered Zeus, that is, by deliberate contrivance. We are inventions. The different generations of mankind aren't links in our evolution, but are like previous models, not entirely like different generations of Volkswagens. Furthermore, all of human history after the disappearance of the heroes recorded in Homer is of this fifth generation, meaning that this account of the generations of humanity has no bearing whatsoever on either the social development of human beings or on the course of history as such these, these overlap. Achilles fought alongside our generation of human beings. It's just a story that references things past. Referencing things past is not the same as history as we understand it. 
History as we understand it, as anyone must understand it in order to be historicist in the sense Popper uses the term, must be continuous with the future as well as the past, must bear as content not just the mere fact of things occurring in sequence, but of there being a specific causality that dictates what future moments of that sequence will be. Hesiod, like Homer, supplies none of this because Hesiod, like Homer, has no such notion of history to begin with. Now, every criticism I fielded concerning Popper's treatment of Homer and Hesiod applies equally to Heraclitus, and so disregarding the myriad other problems with this following quotation from Popper, he is at the very least being absolutely consistent in his historical absurdity when he writes that, quote, The culmination of the various historicist ideas proffered by the early Greek philosophers came with Plato, who, in an attempt to interpret the history and social life of the Greek tribes, and especially of the Athenians, painted a grandiose philosophical picture of the world. He was strongly influenced in his historicism by various forerunners, especially by Hesiod, but the most important influence came from Heraclitus." Unquote. Unlike with Hesiod and Homer, we have no complete works of Heraclitus handed down to us, and the fragments we do have, while evocative, are scant. Popper handles them with a level of sloppiness and ideological loadedness that will be a persistent feature throughout the rest of his book, and he has no choice if his project is to succeed. Thus, at no point does an actual investigation of Heraclitus' thought take place. Rather, Heraclitus is mined for quotes that fit the profile of the historicist, that is to say, the naive but vicious Marxist. Popper carries this out in four moves. First, by way of a brief parroting of Diogenes Laertius's biography of Heraclitus in his Lives of the Eminent Philosophers, Popper establishes Heraclitus as hostile to democracy. We have to be extremely loose with our understanding of democracy to make this stand. Fragments in favor of the wisdom of the few and against the viciousness of the many do not in and of themselves indicate a specific attitude toward democracy as a particular political form in which tribal rule is usurped by the rule of daimoys. Tyrants universally came to power with the help of the lower classes, but at the very least, we can agree with Popper that Heraclitus is suspicious of that which is carried into effect by mass appeal alone. Here, Popper cites fragment B44 in my translation, quote, A people ought to fight for the laws of the city as if they were its walls, unquote. We'll return to this one because it's important. Second, Popper uses this biographical detail, which includes a reference to what must have been the terrifying experience preserved in one of his fragments of seeing one of his aristocratic friends banished by the mob, to explain Heraclitus' seemingly pessimistic fragments concerning the transience and seeming randomness of things. In particular, he cites fragments B124, which reads that the cosmos at best is like a rubbish heap scattered at random, and B91, you can't step in the same river twice. This somehow allows Popper in his mind to make a bizarre reach, writing that, quote, This emphasis on change, especially on change in social life, is an important characteristic not only of Heraclitus' philosophy, but of historicism in general. That things, and even kings, change is a truth which needs to be impressed especially upon those who take their social environment for granted. So much is to be admitted. But in the Heracletian philosophy, one of the less commendable characteristics of historicism manifests itself. Namely, an overemphasis upon change, combined with a complementary belief in an inexorable and immutable law of destiny. Unquote. Third, and here I can quote from Popper directly, quote, The emphasis upon change leads him to the theory that all material things, whether solid, liquid, or gaseous, are like flames, that they are processes rather than things, and that they are all transformations of fire. The apparently solid earth, which consists of ashes, is only fire in a state of transformation. And even liquids, water, the sea, are transformed fire and may become fuel, perhaps in the form of oil. The first transformation of fire is the sea, but of the sea half is earth and half hot air. Thus, all the other elements, earth, water, and air, are transformed fire. Everything is an exchange of fire and fire for everything, just as gold for wares and wares for gold, unquote. Which allows for the fourth move, again quoting from Popper, quote, Having reduced all things to flames, to processes, like combustion, Heraclitus discerns in the processes a law, a measure, a reason, a wisdom. And having destroyed the cosmos as an edifice and declared it to be a rubbish heap, he reintroduces it as the destined order of events in the world process." Unquote. Here, Popper makes the astonishing yet revealing comment that, quote, "...this failure to distinguish between legal laws or norms on the one hand and natural laws or regularities on the other is characteristic of tribal tabooism, unquote. 
Disregarding the fact that Heraclitus only comes to us in fragments and that any links between them is conjectural at best, Popper speculates that this allows Heraclitus, in Popper's terms, to fix upon quote-unquote social dynamics as opposed to social statics and to attribute social progress or change to conflict and strife. Quite why we should want to fix upon social statics as if the social was ever static as opposed to social dynamics is left entirely unexplained, as is the insistence of Heraclitus having cognizance of a social domain of action when the notion of society won't be discussed for a solid millennium and a half at least. This is all par for the course for Popper. We shall see many such instances going forward. The point is that this allows Popper to condemn Heraclitus thusly, quote, And being a typical historicist, he accepts the judgment of history as a moral one, for he holds that the outcome of war is always just, unquote. This, to put it with extraordinary delicacy, is an astonishing conclusion. To begin with, the idea of the moral as distinct from the ethical, i.e. literally just as the character and customs of a place, is very recent historically and assiduously not Greek. It is also apparently not relevant to Popper that this idea that the outcome of war is always just is not actually found in Heraclitus' writings. Heraclitus attributes justice and change to strife, but he never characterizes the outcome of strife as inherently just. Indeed, this would fly in the face of the so-called anti-democratic sentiment Popper imputed to him at the beginning of this section. Nonetheless, Popper relegates to Heraclitus' writings the status of tribal taboo. Now this dilettantish judgment is of no interest to me. Popper is a terrible reader of ancient texts, this much is established. The interesting question is why is he such a terrible reader? Recall fragment B44, quote, a people ought to fight for the laws of the city as if they were its walls." Unquote. The Greek word being translated as laws is nomos and connotes not a written edict or a mere rule, but the literal divisions of the parts of the community taken as a whole. Now Popper comes close to this meaning when elsewhere in this chapter he translates nomos as measure, which is part of the original meaning true, but it isn't sufficient to get him out of assuming a strict one-to-one -one relationship between an article of Roman law, say, and the actual structure of the community itself, its divisions in class and property. The people ought to fight for the laws as if they were its walls. Why? Because in a quite non-trivial way, the laws are its walls. Nomos isn't simply a law or a rule, it is rule plus form in a concrete unity. In later centuries, this sense will be lost. Subtly, in Greek writings like Plato's Laws, or Nomoi in Greek, which will be criticized by Aristotle precisely for failing to account for this concrete unity. Although Aristotle will call this the politeia or constitution, as it is sometimes rendered in English. And less subtly, when Cicero equivocates nomos and the Latin lex. This deeper meaning of nomos also makes sense of fragment B144, which reads, quote, those who speak with understanding must rely firmly on what is common to all as a city must rely on law, and much more firmly. For all human laws are nourished by one law, the divine law. For it has as much power as it wishes and is sufficient for all and is still left over." Unquote. Heraclitus is not talking about law like a mere rule. The polis, in the language of Eric Vogelin, is a cosmion. A little world stamped onto the surface of the earth, its inner division standing in the same relation to its walls as that which divides its world from that of nature, as the innards of an organic body relate to its skin. Either failing means the destruction of the whole. Popper, a dogmatic liberal, cannot imagine affairs outside of a liberal paradigm. He identifies the many against which Heraclitus rails as a public. He identifies law as public edicts, and only sometimes in the context of the discrete parts of nature as measure. The idea that strife and war are the origins of all states of things represents a quasi-mystical resignation to the forces of history rather than an obvious statement of fact that as a structure established by the organization of unequal human participants, the polis and all its internal divisions and inequalities are the temporary sediment of past conflict to be disturbed by future conflict. There's just no notion of history here, and no notion of historical laws by which the future might be determined. And the answers Heraclitus gives in these fragments are answers to questions Popper doesn't even think to ask, so embedded is he in a paradigm of liberalism. By which I mean here not the ethical adherence to an ideal of private freedom a la John Locke and John Stuart Mill, 
but to the concrete divisions making up the form of a community in which the public and the private are rigidly distinct and separate, and progress in the form of transformative innovation, is valid and trustworthy only if it flows from the immediate and free exchange of resources and ideas by private citizens whose place and status as such is itself to be dogmatically treated as ahistorical and untouchable by governmental planning. For Popper, only that society which insists upon this procedure dogmatically is the open society. Now, if taken more modestly as a program by which a society might benefit from free scientific inquiry and discourse, this position has a strong pedigree and is not at all without merit. And in the next episode, we will explore some of its stronger exponents, in particular John Stuart Mill and the less well-known but arguably equally influential Charles Sanders Peirce in some depth. For now, however, we need not trouble ourselves further with Popper's dogmatism insofar as it is productive of well-noted misreads of major political philosophers in this book. Popper insists upon the ubiquitous presence of an idea of history by constant implication. For him, it seems the bare remarking upon such implies adherence to a notion of historical laws, because in a liberal paradigm which assumes that true progress flows only from discourse between private liberal subjects, bearing the surety that a powerful government will protect the products of that discourse, as well as the ability of those liberal subjects to discourse further still in the future, the true and the best are always the products of that discourse, with the perverse result that no challenge to this understanding of the historical unfolding of truth over time by means of social dynamics, nor of the constitutional forms upon which they are premised, can be born. The open society, it seems, is quite securely sealed, and the anti-historicist doctrine of Popper in serious need of edification by actual historicists. In the next episode, when we dive into Popper's critique of Plato, we will scrutinize the concept of the open society, such as Popper construes it. It has its own history, quite apart from Popper's misleadingly dogmatic and, frankly, rather flat use of the name, as a political form in itself, and see just how compelling, and in fact how truly liberal, his vision of liberal politics actually is. As always, thank you for listening, and take care.